one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Project Egg interview. Today, we have the honor of speaking with Swish Goswami from Singapore. How are you doing today, Swish? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the interview. Let's get started. First question for you today is, what is your story? All right. That is an open-ended question, <laughs> so I'll take it in the way that I, I like to, which is, um, I'm a really curious kid. I'm 21 years old right now, uh, an entrepreneur. I'm running a company called TrueFan here in Toronto now. We actually moved up about four days ago. Um, TrueFan basically helps any influencer or brand identify who their top fans are. Um, and it really fits into our ethos and message that we just want to bring the world closer. We want to have fans and idols be somebody that pretty much can have a very proper bond that, that wasn't existing before. Um, and at the same time, too, beyond that, I speak quite a bit. Um, I love debating. I love basketball. Um, and I'm just a normal person when it comes to that. Like I, I, I do stuff like post memes on Instagram and talk crap on LinkedIn. But at the end of the day, what I like to classify myself as is an entrepreneur. And I've been like that fairly, uh, fairly young as well. Let's talk about your childhood. What sort yes. of home were you raised in? What was your uh, family life like when you were very young? Sure. Uh, when I was very young, I was in Singapore till I was seven years old. And um, uh, family was good in the sense of I don't think um, that my dad was very much around a lot because he was working all the time. Um, my mom also worked, but she was kind of like the person that would come home at 4 p.m. and I would see her a lot more. Um, school in Singapore was very competitive. So a lot of my early days, I remember just spending in books uh, and really learning how to be disciplined when it came to studying and then being able to get rewarded for that. Um, by then getting, being able to go outside and do things like play sports, etc. Now, when you were in that environment of mm -hmm. competitive schooling, you are always, always have your nose in the books, and I love that because that, that's me too, in a, in a nutshell. Um, mm -hmm. How do you think that shaped your identity? Sure. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm pretty competitive uh, <laughs> in whatever I, I'm passionate about. Um, so in business, uh, when it comes to just personal development itself, um, basketball, I'm just an insanely competitive person, video games, even, even though I'm actually not that good at it. Um, but at the same time, like, I think it also taught me a lot about realizing that if I have this competitive edge over people, um, what really will differentiate whether I succeed and whether they succeed isn't as much even talent. It's just hard work. Um, and so that's a really cool thought when you think about it is if I just clock more hours and obviously doing the right things, not being an idiot and just coming to work and doing nothing, um, it can actually lead to something a lot bigger. Um, and that's the type of culture that we've tried to instill even with TrueFan. Um, we are in the process right now of hiring more people and it's something that we are going to instill into them is that feeling of, all right, if you want something, go get it and actually try to achieve it by putting in work. Do you think that having a and it, and it sounds like both of your parents were industrious they were both professionals they had you know they were they were working um what did they do and how did what they did mm -hmm. really impact you sure um so it was actually pretty interesting it's a great question um i did a tedx talk when i was 18 on social entrepreneurship because in high school i was very much into nonprofit work um and i think the reason i got so passionate about social entrepreneurship is because of my parents my dad is like he, he sold his soul to the corporate world. He's a director of an oil and gas company. Money, money, money. My mom, on the other hand, has taken pay cuts for the last 15 years to teach English to immigrants and refugees that have come to Canada for the first time. Um, so those dinner conversations, as you can imagine, were incredible to be a part of and to just see those two perspectives collide. And that's what I would even define social entrepreneurship as, right? It's not only thinking about um, people, but it's also having a profit mindset, despite what some people might think. You're seven years old. Mm -hmm. You're moving from Singapore to Canada, right? Canada, yep. What was that like for you to just be completely uprooted, have to mm -hmm. move however many miles away, and yeah. basically, you know, there, there's this opportunity, or maybe it's a it's a burden, but I guess it depends on how you look at it. But what was it like for you to start over, if you will? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously I was seven, so I can't remember like specific memories, but I do vividly remember being angry about moving. 
um, because I love Singapore. Um, I think it's by far one of the best countries in the world. And so actually moving from Singapore to Canada was a decline in quality of life <laughs> in terms of how clean and disciplined and like how advanced Singapore really is, honestly, as a city. Um, at the same time, though, I also was you know, pretty angry about leaving my friends behind that I developed over the last two, three years in Singapore. Um, I actually still stay in touch with them even now, which is pretty cool on a WhatsApp group. Um, but I think I had to move. I knew that I had to move because of military service. So conscription came in uh, to Singapore when I was seven years old. My brother is five years older than me. So my parents didn't think there was really a future for us in Singapore because my brother didn't want to go into military service. And obviously I was seven years old, so no one gave a crap what I thought. But uh, we decided to move. And I think you also kind of have to live with the, with the outcome then because you didn't, you couldn't really go back and do anything else. That's, that's so very true. And I, I think the fact that at seven years old, you kind of realize, all right, it, it makes sense. Like I have to go. And I think yeah. that may have even made it a little bit easier in, in, in some ways. So, okay, so now you're seven years old, you just moved to this new place. Um, I'm assuming you were, you were going to school. Um, mm -hmm. What was the difference like in the schools, all right? Because you were saying Singapore was very competitive and it was yeah. awesome mindset, awesome culture. What was that yeah. shift of changing uh, your, your academic life or your, your uh, environment totally. there? It was so fun and easy. <laughs> the Asian education system is way ahead than, than the Western education system. Um, I was learning things that people were learning in grade six and grade two. Um, and so when I came in, actually, both my brother and I uh, were given the option to go up several grades. Uh, we both decided to turn it down, partly because my mom both thought that we were so lazy that we would eventually screw up somewhere. Um, but also because, you know, socially it would be weird to be like a, an eight, you know, 14 year old in a grade 12 class, you know, something like that. Um, it wasn't to say that we were geniuses. I actually really do believe that both of us, again, we work really hard and that is a huge determinant for our success. But at the same time, too, I actually do think that over time I've become stupider. Like I was so academically gifted when I was younger, growing up, especially in Calgary, when I thought I was the smartest person in the room. Whereas now I, I definitely do think I'm smart, but I don't think that on paper you would think of me as smart. I think it's more like my EQ is really high. My IQ is just meh. <laughs> so you, you were talking about how back in Singapore, that education system is light years ahead of what you found in Canada. Yep. Can you talk about what those structural differences were? Like, what was the determining factor, or maybe there are multiple factors, that mm -hmm. really made it such a superior experience for you there? Sure. I think two things. One is teachers are pushed um, to put a curriculum out that is incredibly advanced in Singapore at a very young age. So in grade two, I was learning exponents. Um, in grade five, Singaporean students learn basic calculus. Um, it's ridiculous. So they have like a five year advantage pretty much on learning calculus that we would only learn in grade 12 in Canada. Um, beyond that too, though, I think, again, it is a very competitive system. Um, there is a, an institution of something called academic tracking, where students in Singapore are basically around grade two, grade three, they're put into one of three streams. They're put into the gifted stream, they're put into this normal moderate stream, or they're put into this like, you know, this person needs work stream, uh, and we need to get them up to par. Um, and so it can actually be, a lot of studies have found that it can actually be incredibly uh, harmful to a kid's mindset growing up to be academically tracked. Because sure, like, you know, it actually goes kind of worse in both ways. Like if you're put in the gifted stream, you might think that you're a genius throughout and then get to college and think, oh, my God, what happened? Like I was in the gifted stream. What happened? Like I didn't develop socially. Um, you can also equally be put in the under par stream and think that you're an idiot. And it can have a compounding effect on your mindset in terms of how you approach school, how you think about school, whether you even want to pursue an undergrad after high school. I, I totally agree with you that setting setting kids on a path at such a young age, at such mm -hmm. a, um impressionable age, you yep. basically saying, Okay, you're a smart kid, go on and, and do what smart kids do and you know, setting setting other kids on a path that, you know, may not be so fruitful for them later on down the road. And like you said, I, I very much agree that it does compound over time. So I'm I'm glad yep. you brought those things up. So 
you're we got past when you when you were young mm-hmm. let's talk about high school right who All are right. you as a person <laughs> in high school you as mentioned basketball you mentioned yeah. doing some nonprofit stuff you mentioned a few things so who were you and yeah. what was that experience like for you Sure. Um, so I, I'm, I've always been fairly socially gifted, so making friends isn't very hard for me. Um, when I came into high school, I came into a private school, though, which had a grade size of about 55 people. So my grade had 54 other people, and it was a very tight-knit family feel, um, which I actually kind of liked um, because it meant that, again, making friends was very easy. But more importantly, um, I got like one-to-one attention from all of my teachers. I actually felt like I was learning something. I felt like I could go and ask questions and not be ostracized or, you know, thought of as stupid for that. Um, in school, though, I, I did a lot. Like, I did a lot in high school. Like, I, I debated on Canada's national debate team. Uh, we competed at two world tournaments, one in Thailand, the second in Singapore, where I went back to my home country. And get this, I lost in the grand final against Singapore. So I lost to my home country in my home country in 2015. Um, I was student council president in grade 12. Um, I volunteered quite a bit, did a lot of nonprofit work outside. Um, I was part of like a mayor's youth education council. I wrote for a sports blog called The Young Wanderer. Like I just was a kid doing things. You know, I played on the basketball team in grade 10 and 11. Like I think the big thing that I really liked about myself in high school is I tried everything. And in the process of doing that, I really figured out like what I liked, what I didn't like, made a mental note of it. And it really helped me, especially when I came to college and I realized I actually don't want to go into finance or I don't want to be a business student. I'd rather have a social life to start off with. Um, Think about entrepreneurship as a career. And while I'm thinking of an idea, be part of a social sciences stream that isn't as hard and tolling on my health. Let's let's drill down into the into the high school years a little bit more. You said that you were very active in the debate team or you know mm-hmm. you were you were helping to lead the, the team and y'all went to nationals i believe you said two different years um yep. what attracted you to that particular yes. uh, activity activity yeah. yeah 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 um so i started debating in grade seven uh the primary reason is because my brother was debating so my brother and i are very competitive we love each other to death but if he does something, I'm always like, all right, I can do that as well. Like we did that for cricket. We did that for pretty much everything. Um, and so in grade seven, I started joining debate. That year, actually, my brother, who's five years older than me, won the world competition in Qatar. So he represented Canada. He won there. So the pressure off the beginning when I joined debate was incredibly high. <laughs> um, when I was in grade 10, then I got onto the national team and my brother actually was my coach. Um, he was in college, but he was the high school national team coach, which was really nice. And, um, I think debate attracted me primarily because it not only teaches you a lot about critical thinking, not only gives you a lot of great public speaking experience, but the people involved in the activity are some of the smartest people I've ever met. Like they're not nerdy people. They're people that in my opinion, are just so curious about the world. They want to make a difference. They think about the world, not as, you know, one black and white situation, but in a very nuanced and complex way. Um, which is really cool because a lot of the work that they did outside of debate factored into that. You know, these were people that had businesses, they had nonprofits, they did a lot of volunteering work as well. And it's been really cool then to be able to even now look back and see where my debate network has taken me with the people that I know that are all over the world, um, but doing some really, really cool things. It seems like when you're on a debate team, one of the things that, and you mentioned it, one of the things that are very important, um, or one of the skills that is very important is public speaking. Yes. So how did y'all, and there's my Southern coming out, how did y'all yeah. practice? How did you train? How did you develop those skills? Totally. Um, so weirdly enough, in grade seven, I was really scared of debate. Um, so when I joined it, I was a bit apprehensive because I have a list and I had a hard time, especially then, it's gotten a little better now, but I have a hard time saying S's and R's properly. Like my name, my full name is Ferochish, which already has so many S's, and so my parents really screwed me on that one too. But uh, but at the same time, when I came into grade seven, I thought I couldn't probably do it. Um, I went to a speech therapist three times, hated the experience because I felt like I was being you know pushed down as somebody who was, you know, for lack of a better word, like I had a problem, which I really didn't feel like I did, um, especially compared to other people that have far worse disabilities. I didn't think having a speech disability was the worst thing in the world. But that being said, I think the way I practiced public speaking was just doing it more, you know, like every competition getting better, 
every time that I practice in front of the mirror, every time that I did a speech in front of my parents, every time I forced my brother to just listen to me over a phone call where I could rehearse a seven minute speech defending a particular topic that he gave me 15 minutes beforehand, these moments all added up. And even now, like, I don't think I'm a master of public speaking in any way. I think I have a lot to learn. But what's really cool is, especially in high school, my debating style, my public speaking style was very different uh, than it is now. Um, you know, now I've started, you know, at least thinking at least that I'm a little more funny in my speeches. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe I'm not. Um, but I'm also very attentive to listening to other people and responding to what they say, very much like you right now, right? You're, you're taking in what I'm saying and you're responding it to it. Uh, a lot of people don't do that when they speak. They they only speak and nothing nothing comes back this way. I think that's very interesting that one of the one of the keys and I believe that you're saying to speaking and to to debating is to actually listen, right? To to mm-hmm. practice the art of listening cuz I, I do think it is an art. Um so it's very interesting that that you bring that up. So we talked about debate. Yep. Um let's talk about sports because it seems like you you were talking about cricket and you're talking about basketball Mm -hmm. and now later in your entrepreneurial journey it seems like there's definitely a bit of a sports component there too where did that love of sports come from and how Mm -hmm. did you really start to figure out oh man the sports thing is cool i want to go do more of that like what was your journey with sports sure Uh, i mean again it came from my brother my brother is madly passionate about every sport pretty much uh, growing up, he was a uh, Colts fan for football. He was a Lakers fan for basketball. He followed Team India and cricket, waking up at 4 a.m. to watch these games that were aired. Um, we, we played volleyball. We did karate. Like We just did a lot of sports. And generally, obviously, because my mom also pushed it, but my brother did it, so I did it. Um, and I think growing up, honestly, sports also were a great way to just de-stress. Um, I was doing quite a bit, especially academically. I was being pushed quite, quite heavily. And I felt like being able to go out from 6 to 8 p.m. and put a basketball in a net uh, just felt like a great activity to be able to take the edge off. Um, that being said, even now, like with a company that we, we have, you know, we're working with athletes uh, that have invested in our company or our clients. Um, we have individuals that are in the sports space that we're madly passionate about because, again, our idea is helping fans connect with their idols. And you know that in sports, there's mad hysteria over fan culture there, right? You know, fan culture is so big within sports. So us being able to even take part in that is bringing me back to my childhood days when I was a fan myself. It's funny that you mention that culture of, of like mass hysteria when it comes to, to being a fan. Um, yep. I, I'm from New Orleans and so obviously we're, we're Saints fans here. And yep. uh, <laughs> we, there's, this, there's this little uh, funny thing that, that we say in my family if ever we're doing really well, you know, we score a touchdown or, or we, you know, take the lead or something, nobody's allowed to change their seating positions. You have yeah, to stay. Yeah, you have same, to thing. stay. same thing. You have to stay where you're. And by the way, if you were holding a glass, you got to hold that glass. You got to keep back it up. Hold. Pick it back up and hold it. Everyone in the same position. Absolutely. I love that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's funny that you mentioned that. Um, so you talked a little bit about nonprofit work that you did in high school. Can you really drill down and speak sure. to the different things that you were doing both inside of the academic ecosystem and outside? Yeah. Um, so within school, there was a project called the Legacy Project, which I started. Um, basically, what we did is we went to communities surrounding our school um, and we picked up bottles and we went to the bottle depot. We got 10 cents for each bottle. We raised money and then we went on to an organization called Kiva, which is a microfinancing organization. And we funded uh, individuals that we thought uh, deserved this money. Um, you know, in grade 11, the, the themes that I pushed for were women and water. Um, and so those were two big themes that we focused on when it came to who we were going to put money towards in terms of giving them that grant and really making them even pen pals, like writing to them, hearing from them, telling the school about their story. Um, it was a really, really cool project. It still exists today within the school, which is great. Whenever I go back, you know, the legacy project is still there, which I love. Um, the second thing outside of school was an organization called Canda Thinks. Um, and I hated TEDx Talks, which was ironic, and later on I did, I did give them. But I hated the idea that you go to a TEDx Talk or whatever, an event, and you sit as an audience member and you hear these people that are put forward to you like gods and you have no interaction with them whatsoever. I hated that. 
Um, I wanted there to be engagement between the speaker and the audience. I thought that was fun. I thought that's stimulating. I actually think that makes the conversation a lot better. Um, and so that's what we decided to do. We decided to go build better conferences. Um, and in the process of doing that, 25% of all the revenue we generated in a year would go towards a youth fund um, that would fund young entrepreneurs in rural areas. Uh, and so what was really cool is I actually leveraged my debate network. I, I expanded the company from Canada things to world things by going into Bermuda, Argentina, which had currency control, which kind of sucked, and the United States. And I got people that I met at debating tournaments to go home, start a chapter of their own, and then put that money towards into something that we called the World Youth Fund that could then even fund young entrepreneurs across the world, um, which was super cool. Sadly, I, when I came into university um, in second year, I wasn't able to continue doing that. Um, and the organization just dissolved. Um, I wish that it could still run with other people, but I kind of learned from a very early stage that I was the main driver for that organization because I really had a social purpose for starting it that a lot of other kids that came in didn't really have. They wanted to do it for their resume or they wanted to do it for like an application. They didn't really want to do it for the social purpose like I did. You're talking about social purpose and how mm -hmm. very few others felt that same drive and that, and that yeah. they didn't get the same amount of motivation from that. Why do you think you responded so uh, strongly to that? Why do you think that that was such that that evoked such passion from you? Yeah, I mean, in debate, um, you know, the people that I met weren't always the, the most well off people uh, at international debating tournaments. I, I met people from Israel. I met people from Palestine. I uh, met people from Syria. Uh, and the stories that you hear are just incredible. They're, they're the stories of resilience, courage, hope. Um, and these stories, I feel, also at the same time gave me a level of empathy, um, which is the ability to just identify with somebody else's problems and recognize them and put your own issues into perspective. Uh, and I think that's seriously lacking in our society here. Sadly, we don't teach empathy. It's very hard to teach empathy, in my opinion. But at the same time, I think there are a lot of kids, especially my age, that uh, they claim to be empathetic. But if it was up to them, there would be only one person that succeeded, and that would be them. And that's just a sad truth. So you're doing this nonprofit work. You're on the debate team. You're excelling at your academics. And you're also playing sports and also having a social life and making a ton of friends. What was it like for you to then basically leave that entire ecosystem and mm -hmm. go to college? What was that like? Yeah. What was that journey? Sure. The transition was pretty easy, honestly. Um, the, the, the actual idea of picking a college was a little harder. I definitely had a lot of options. Um, and it wasn't like, you know, I was going to Harvard or anything like that. Those weren't options for sure. But I had options within the UK. I had options within the US, a lot of liberal arts colleges in the US, uh, and then options within Canada. Um, and I definitely wanted a different college experience. But at the same time, I also knew that I, I never wanted to work a job per se. Like I always kind of knew around grade 12 and grade in, in first year that I'd either be a lawyer, uh, in which case, obviously, whatever school I go to, I can get into the law school of my dreams if I work hard. Um, or I wanted to start my own company, in which case the place that I pick shouldn't be as much about the program, in my opinion, as it should be in the place itself. Like, am I putting myself in an ecosystem that could facilitate my entrepreneurial drive? Or am I going to like, you know, the middle of freaking nowhere uh, to study this amazing degree and then come out with college debt? Um, so I decided Toronto because my brother also was there, which was helpful. Um, you know, having somebody like him, having his entire friend group that I knew for so many years in high school, having a great debate community out in Toronto. When I came to Toronto, it was a very seamless transition again. Uh, and again, like, you know, meeting friends, not a very hard thing for me to do. So the cool thing is that I had my brother's network. I had my debating network. I had a couple of my own school friends that were going to the U University of Toronto. And then I was able to meet people in my residence. So it was a really, really good experience in that front in terms of just having people immediately around me and not feeling alone, which I think many people can definitely feel during that transition. So you're going through college, you made the transition. Yep. What was your actual college experience like? 
and what things did you accomplish while you were there? Sure. Uh, so in first year, I got into a selective program called Peace Conflict Justice Studies. Uh, it's out of the Monk School of Global Affairs. It's the only undergrad program that they offer. Um, I debated for Hart House. Uh, I attended Worlds as well. Didn't do very well, sadly. University debate is a lot harder. And if you're in first year and you're competing against like third year masters of economic students, it's very hard to beat them on specific topics. Um, but that being said, debated. Um, I started a number of ventures in, in university. A lot of actually, a lot of them failed because the idea just wasn't good enough, uh, or I wasn't able to commit that much time to it because I was also balancing school, especially in first year. Um, but then in second year, you know, second year, I honestly, I think only went to three classes because at the time I was building out a wearables company and I was building that out with my high school debate partner who went to Wharton. Um, he was studying a combined like life sciences and business degree. And, um, we were building that out. We had the opportunity to go and, and raise some money from a VC called JB Fitzgerald with Trevor Booker. Um, and after we were able to license that technology out, I moved to New York where I was able to work for his VC. Uh, and after New York, that whole story comes in, but I bet you have questions about that specific phase right now. Yeah. Sure. So let's talk about specifically that first year. Yep. When you were saying that you were starting different ventures and they weren't really taking off like you wanted them to bring us through that timeline and i'm really yep. interested in in drilling down into how did you start it like what actionable mm -hmm. steps did you take to get started with all those different ventures totally so there were three companies that i tried to start in the first year uh one was called food share which was my friend with my friend quinn underwood um we tried basically building out an app that could connect college students to leftover and excess food I saw a lot of events, I saw a lot of households, I saw a lot of stores that were throwing out excess food, and I thought it'd be really cool to be able to package all of that and give it to college students. Um, we actually didn't realize, but four months after developing out the product, after talking to a bunch of people, we realized that there's an act in Canada called the Food Donation Act of 1994, which restricts people from making money off donations of food. So we didn't have an ability to monetize the app and it was just cutthroat. And like it was a really, really rough time in terms of realizing like all of the work that you did in the last three, four months uh, went to nothing. Um, the second was an idea that I've had called Millennial Council. Um, I thought it would be super cool to bring together some of the top debaters that I knew uh, into basically like a virtual think tank where we could take maybe three or four issues every year, write papers about them, uh, and then spread those papers to agencies, to inner development uh, bodies that could basically take the our ideas and enact it and actually start trying to be able to put some action towards it. Um, sadly, again, that didn't work because of communication issues. We had about 18 debaters across the world, very hard to be able to like obviously manage those people, get them to do their work on time, and then even get them to come onto team calls or any sort of like monthly calls that we were trying to organize. So that failed. Um, and then the final thing that I tried starting in, in first year that, again, didn't do as well was an agency called Rafiki Media. Um, I tried doing like a media company where we would work with clients to promote their social media. At the time, I had no social media prowess as opposed to now where I do, of course, have a following on LinkedIn and Instagram. But at the time, I just I, I thought I could do it based on just watching videos about SEO and social media and paid advertising and I could get away with it. But again, it was a service-based business, couldn't devote that much time to it. So obviously it was going to fail if you can't devote time to a client-facing business. Um, and that was, again, a huge lesson in terms of learning what comes with a service-based business, which is putting in a lot of effort, time of your own into not only thinking about overall strategy, which I think I'm really good at, but also going and getting dirty in the trenches in terms of closing clients, following up with them, and actually being able to meet uh, their requirements. So we got through first year. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this very interesting uh, story that you were telling about um, raising money for yep. for this venture. So mm -hmm. let's really drill down into how did you create the idea? How yep. did you get the people on board? And then how sure. did you actually go and initiate that process of raising money? Got it. Do you mind if I quickly just put this in? Charging. Go I for just it. gotta yeah. make sure I don't die on you. <laughs> <laughs> Put this in. 
All right. Uh, okay. Perfect. Um, so the idea for True Fan. So I moved to New York. And after the VC, I worked for a company called Dunk, D-U-N-K. So on Instagram, at D-U-N-K, had a really big following, about 2.2 million followers when I joined. It was started by my roommate and a really good friend of mine named Elliot. Um, Elliot created it in 2013. He grew it to a massive scale, but he didn't really have the business chops of being able to work with brands, to fundraise, to be able to even get clients to monetize the platform that he had built online. So that's what I came in to help him out with. Um, did that for about six months, and in December of 2017, I came up with the idea for TrueFan when one of the people we were working with, Mark Zablo, who is an advisor now for TrueFan, but he runs a company called Cogent Marketing. They do all of AT&T, Corona, Dwayne Wade, Chris Paul social media. He gave me the idea for TrueFan by saying, do you have a tool that Chris Paul could use to find his most engaged fans in Houston? Uh, and I didn't at the time, but I thought it was a super cool idea started looking into it and realized we could actually build this into a proper business and product. So at the time, I didn't have anybody on the team. Um, you know, I, I, in January, came around and asked one of my best friends, Anna Claire, um, who I met when I won an award called Top 20 or 20 when I was 17 years old. Um, what are you doing? He was at Stanford at the time. He told me that he'd be down to help out with the project and maybe even drop out if it went somewhere. And, um, and that was our first person. Like I started working with Anna. We wanted to make it a mobile application initially, um, which we spent about five, six months doing. It never really panned out, so we decided to transition to, to a web platform. But in that, pro in that time as well, within December 2017 to December 2018, a lot happened. Um, we got a number of other team members, like Scott Bertie, who's out of Ottawa. Uh, he came on as our head of sales. Tim Will Hyde came on out of, out of England as our CMO. Uh, and we had a guy named Trevor Eastman that came on as our CFO out of Utah. So a very remote team. We actually literally worked remotely for about seven months. Uh, nobody had met each other before except for me and Onik when I was 17 and then Scott and me um, at an event just once. Um, but we still came on to two weekly team calls. We still tried to do as much work as we could to build a proper list of clients that we thought would get interested in the product. And that really helped us when it came to fundraising then was having this awesome team having this good product idea at the time. We only actually built out the product in November of last year, but we had a great idea for what it would be. And then we had a lot of interested clients, like over 250 brands, over 400 influencers that really were interested in the concept. Um, and so that really helped with fundraising in terms of raising our initial 500,000, being able to then build out the product in November, and then being able to raise another round recently from round 13 capital where we are right now uh, to be able to move to Toronto and really take this to another level. So when you were actually going and building relationships with uh, these influencers and these incredible people, what actionable steps did you take to meet them, engage them in that conversation and sell the idea? Sure. I mean, a lot of these influencers and brands were friends of mine uh, in the sense of the people that worked there um, or the influencers themselves. So, you know, asking for introductions to my friends, to them, um, or networking with them was something that I had done way in advance. Uh, and that was really good. I really focused on my network ever since I was like 18 or 17, which was really helpful. That being said, though, um, when I did go and meet them, I tried as much as possible not to sell them on anything. I just tried to tell them about the concept, ask them if they were interested, and get as much feedback as possible from them. And even now, like our process right now for this month is trying to go to all of those great beta testers and people that have provided us feedback and shown interest and closing them onto payment plans. Because for the longest time, our approach has been, let's make the product, at, like, you know, let's get the product ready, let's put it in a situation where it can really succeed. But at the same time, Let's try as much as possible to provide value to people first before asking for anything in return. So we've built out like a repertoire of tools, like best practices documents that we've sent to so many people to try to build up goodwill with them to make sure that they realize that at the end of the day, we're not just looking for their money. We're looking to build a serious relationship with them. I want to take a quick pivot and I want to talk about a few things in your past and mm -hmm. then I want to circle back to specifically what your biggest focus is now but but let's cool. cover a few more things in, in your past um, you mentioned a few things that I'm going to talk about specifically 
you said you won a 20 under 20 award when you were 17. So yeah. I'd like to hear yeah. about that. Um, and then yeah. I'd also like to hear about your TEDx experience. Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, in all the nonprofit work, all the stuff that I was doing in high school, um, one of my school members nominated me for this award called Candace Top 20 or 20. It was run by an organization at the time called Plan Canada. Um, and I went through an interview process, uh, both on a phone call and in person, and uh, I found out I won it. Um, by no means do I actually do, like think that I'm a top 20 under 20 in Canada. Um, I think that a lot of times these lists are either bogus or obviously, you know, they can't fit everyone in. But just being able to actually have some validation that what I was doing was meaningful to certain people um, and to kind of give me the extra motivation to keep going, that was great. Um, and actually, the, the thing that I take away from top 20 under 20, most of all, isn't really the award itself. It's the people that I met at the award. When you think about it, like my co-founder, somebody on my team is someone that I met at that award show. He was my roommate for that week long event when we were being celebrated. And we always laughed about starting a company together with no idea that we would do it four years down the road. Um, so that was great. Um, in terms of my TEDx experience, um, I, again, I've never applied for a TEDx talk. Um, so I've done three now and the first one came around by accident. Uh, I was at the University of Toronto in first year and I was volunteering for TEDx. That speaker dropped out three weeks beforehand. And the team knew that I did a lot of debating, that I was fairly good at public speaking, that I had done some social work before. So they gave me the opportunity to audition. I did fairly well at the audition. And then I got to do a talk on social entrepreneurship. The second talk, uh, it was in Alberta. And they just asked me to speak uh, over LinkedIn. They were like, would you like to speak at the event? I'm like, sure, let's do it. I went back to Alberta and I spoke about personal branding and LinkedIn. And then the third talk that I did four or five months ago, which was at Wilfrid Laurier, they asked me again over Instagram. Um, and I did the talk on mental health. So I don't think I'm going to do a TEDx talk for a while now. I'm pretty much done and out of ideas. But uh, <laughs> at the same time, I do like that three talks that I've done are very much things that I'm, I'm a big passion, passion, passionate guy for, sorry, which would be social entrepreneurship, personal branding, and mental health. And I, and I still talk about that even to date in all of my other talks that I do. So we've covered pretty extensively your history. Right, mm -hmm. and how you've now gotten to where you are. First question, mm -hmm. what do we miss, right? Like wh what other important things happened that we didn't talk about yet? I think family oriented actually. The, what, you did actually start off asking about family, which I love, but uh, over the last four years, a lot has happened on that front. Um, and, and so part of what has defined me, especially this year more than ever, and, and last year as well, is uh, obviously I was very empathetic growing up, but I've also matured very quickly um, because of the fact that I've had a divorce in my family, a bad divorce in my family. Um, I've lost my grandparents at a very young age. Um, I've had friends that have tried to commit suicide um, and, and stuff like this. I'm not trying to say just to get sympathy, but I'm trying to say that it has defined me for who I am right now, which is uh, the reason I speak about mental health so passionately even now isn't just because it's a trendy topic, it's because I have actually seen people around me that have had terrible crippling mental health uh, to the point where I didn't even know how I could help them. And I don't want anybody to ever be in that situation, both as the victim of mental health or also as the people around who feel helpless. Um, so that's a huge thing that, that I think would be as an addition is all those experiences on the personal end have defined my career path for the, for the most part. And I, I'm very glad that you, you brought that up um, because, you know, I, I totally agree. Like family is extremely important to me. It's, it's a, to me, family is the most important thing. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And I appreciate you sharing uh, the personal side because sometimes it's, uh, it's sensitive to, to talk about that. Yeah, so I appreciate you being very open and honest about it. Um, so, okay. This is one of my favorite parts uh of, of mm -hmm. the interview so we talked all about what you have done in the past but let's talk about what your biggest focus is right now and mm -hmm. can you please give us a super in-depth look at <laughs> true fan future oh true fan oh god i was like oh no um let's do it um so what was the first part of that again what is your biggest focus right now like what are all the things that you're doing right now Cool. So, so right now I split my time up in three ways. The majority of the time is spent on TrueFan, 
um, which I'll give an in-depth look right after. Uh, the second thing is I do speak quite a bit under a bureau. And what's really cool is I actually speak at a lot of events where I can talk about true fans. So they're kind of linked together. Um, the third thing is I have a book coming out in October on youth entrepreneurship through Kogan Page, which is a UK publisher. Um, and then kind of wrapping all, all of that up is the social media content that I put out on LinkedIn and Instagram. But that, of course, ties into everything. Um, in terms of an in-depth look at TrueFan, um, anybody can learn more about it on TrueFan.io, T-R-U-F-A-N.io. But the gist behind it is it's a web platform. You come on, you sign up, put your social media details in, and our algorithm and our platform can analyze your influential, engaged, and trending fans. And you're on the platform itself. You're able to reach out to these people. You're able to reward them. You're able to learn a little more about them by clicking into their profile and seeing what they're interested in, what their most used word was, what their recent activity has looked like. And then what's really cool is that even stepping back, you can export a data list on the platform to be able to have all your top fans on it. And you can put that data list back into social media as an advertising set to be able to retarget those people with advertising you put out on social media. So what we're basically then trying to do is not only help you reward your fans, but make your advertising more targeted and more effective. That is brilliant. And you're, Appreciate that. <laughs> you're speaking to somebody who loves marketing and, and digital marketing and retargeting and all that stuff. Like You're totally speaking my language. Lovely. How did you create the – like? You told me how you got the idea for, for the mm-hmm. business, but how did you go from do you have this tool to building out all of these different and very niched features? Because not many people really yeah. understand what retargeting is, right? So how did you build totally. out that whole suite of product? So I kid you not, the, the product focus has really come into our team for the last two months. Um, we weren't as product oriented as we are now. We are insanely obsessed with product. Now, every discussion, every team call revolves around product first before anything else. Uh, but that being said, the first iteration of the product was so bad. (laughs) And what I mean by that, it was, it was a splash page. You go on, you link your social media and you see your top fans and you're able to export a data list. That's it. You know, there was no beautiful looking dashboard. There was no beautiful looking overarching homepage to see if the tool was actually working for me. When I clicked into a fan, I wasn't able to see an extensive fan profile. Um, all of those product ideas came over time. And the, the big lesson that I've taken away from it is you have to be patient. You have to have a really clear roadmap of what you want to achieve. And as much as possible, you need to be listening to your customers in terms of what they want. Because you might have an idea for what the product should look like, but it could be totally different from what your customer base wants. When it comes to truly listening to your customers, Mm-hmm. How do you engage them and get their attention in a meaningful way? Because we're all busy. We all have yeah. things that we're trying to do. We have uh, you know, family and work and personal mm-hmm. stuff. So many different things are going. It's really hard to get somebody's attention and to get yep. really clear, relevant, and meaningful feedback. So how – do you go about making that process easier? Totally. Um, so the big thing for me, I think, is as much as possible, realizing that true fan, what we're really trying to do is help marketing managers do their job. And if anything, I actually think what we're trying to do is help them keep their job um, so that when they go and they talk to their bosses and they're like, all right, this is what I've done, they could not perform their job again at that level without true fan. That is our goal. So when we think about it as our goal, we kind of work backwards from there. And, and what I mean by that is as much as possible, the way that we talk to these people is very much feedback oriented. Just like I said, we're not a salesy team. You know, we do obviously have a sales focus now. But that being said, even when we sell, we try as much as possible to provide value first. So sending you a best practices document, giving you a data report free of cost to your inbox so you can check those fans out. And you can learn something about our core thesis, which is connecting you to your top fans. We can do all of that before we even get on a phone call with you. And we definitely do try to do that as well. It's interesting that you use the word connecting with your mm-hmm. top fans. Because one of the the core foundations of this show is connection, right? It's connection mm-hmm. between you and I, right? 
the the yep. host and the guest. It's the connection between us and the beautiful people who are listening to this, right? The the cast and the and the audience, right? And and it's all about connection, right? And and I'm really interested in learning your philosophy on this. Also, be, not only because of what you're doing now, but also because you've mentioned a few times that it's always been really easy for you to make friends, and that's something that um, mm -hmm. you know has been recurrent throughout the or recurring throughout the interview. So, mm -hmm. what is your philosophy on establishing truly meaningful connection with another human being? Yeah, um, I think the first thing is listening, which is what debate taught me. Right, the only way to really have a meaningful connection with someone is by not just talking but listening to them and really taking in what they're saying and trying not as much as, as much as possible, trying not to talk to them with an agenda. Like the amount of times that I speak at events and sometimes people come up to me and I clearly know that they have no appetite of listening, it's crazy. Like I know when people come up to me and they have an agenda of where they want to go with the conversation and no matter what I say, we are definitely going to hit that topic. So that's step one is listening with an eye of being able to adapt your agenda or just have no agenda in the very first place. The second thing, again, when you connect with people is making sure as much as possible that you're helping them out first with no expectation of getting anything back. That is a personal philosophy. It is now also a company philosophy. The third and final thing when it comes to connecting with people is, is I think, in my opinion, at least, being very honest and transparent. Um, honesty is something that I've learned primarily through my family. Um, especially again with all of the family issues, I've seen how trust can entirely erode um, a situation and make it terrible. Um, I've also seen how fragile trust actually is. Um, and I really believe that honesty is something that you kind of sometimes only have a one shot thing at. You know, if you screw it up sometimes, uh, it's very hard to be able to mend a relationship after trust is broken. So if the foundation of any relationship is trust, then a focus when it comes to connecting with people needs to be on just being yourself, being honest, being reasonable, and as much as possible, especially on a personal or professional end, being transparent about what you want and what you're doing. I love how you talked about honesty and the foundation of trust because mm -hmm. that's something that I think a lot about um, in, in all the things that I do, right? Because there have been situations where and I'm sure everybody's experienced this when you're speaking to somebody who you have a lot of uh, trust with. You built a good connection with a good good rapport, and you then discover that in one specific instance they lied to you. At that point, and you didn't know that, and they didn't say it, but you discovered it. At that point, how do you know? everything else that they've said exactly all the wasn't other a lie. things it, yeah. it wasn't a lie like there's there's no way to know it's why you know adultery for example within relationships it's 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 hard to come back i can i can imagine right like you were saying if, if somebody lies to you about something so big as being with somebody else during a relationship um what makes you believe that they couldn't have been lying about anything else and again that thought itself isn't a good thought to have but it is merited in certain situations, like for example, with adultery. So I can totally see again how trust is a fragile thing. Um, you shouldn't take it for granted. And at the same time, like even with any person that you meet, um, try to find opportunities to not only build their trust, but don't push it. You know, it, it needs to be a two-way thing. You can't force somebody to trust you. Uh, I've learned that in a very hard way. Um, you need to just let it come to you. And again, sometimes people just aren't meant to, to be connected to you. And if that's the case, move on. Figure out the other people in your life or figure out the other people in the world that can give you more time and attention and value. It is so interesting that you that you just said that because of, and, and specifically what I'm talking about is not everybody's going to be – you're not going to be as close with everybody. You're not going to be able to build <laughs> that foundation of trust with everybody because yeah. – and I'm sure, again, I'm sure everybody can relate to this where you spend so much time trying to develop a relationship with somebody or, or uh, keep, continue the, the conversation and, and follow up with them and stay in touch. And they just – they're not interested. Like they don't, they don't want to do it. They're not putting forth the effort. That same effort that you're putting forth with them, 
I mean, you could have put forth the same effort with three different people and had very meaningful conversations, right? So I think that's a great takeaway is know when to – like pick your battles almost, right? Like who do you want to invest time in and in, in who you don't? Um, so I just went off on a little tangent. Sorry, no, I love end. that. Yeah, <laughs> um, I love that. But it, but it, it was inspired by, by what you said and I, and, and I totally agree. Um, one of the other things that I'm very interested in, in asking you about um, – is your your greatest theory right if yeah. if you think back in history right the the greatest people the people who we still know about today you know like the ben yeah. franklins of the world they have a theory right they, yeah. they have a theory and they put it to the test mm-hmm. what is your greatest theory sure i don't think i've concretely figured that out entirely yet uh, i definitely have a lot of learning to come uh in in my future years but that being said, I think one of the one of the theories that I have is the world isn't as big as we'd like to think it is. Um, and whether it's my work with building technology, whether it's my work with being able to show people um, how close the world truly is when it comes to the problems that we face, the situations that we're in, the feelings that we all have. Um, that's something that I try to do with everything in terms of speaking, in terms of writing, in terms of my social media presence. And it is something that I'm going to continue to do even in whatever else I do in the future, which I definitely have an idea for. Um, and it'll, it'll be always to do with helping people out and trying to bring them together. What are you the most afraid of? What am I the most afraid of? I mean, beyond spiders and bees. <laughs> um, honestly, I think the, the, the biggest fear is, is not living up to my potential. Um, and it sounds like a, a weird fear to have, but there are obviously a lot of moments where I look back and I'm like, wow, you know, like uh, I'm in a situation now where I have a great uh, amount of people around me, very talented people around me. I have good ideas. I have this luxury of being able to do what I love every single day. Um, I always have the fear of what if it runs out? What if that luck goes away? Um, what if the situation gets worse? And then also more importantly, what if I, you know, grow up when I'm 30 and 35 and I lose that same motivation, ambition that I have right now. So that I think is a big fear. It's not living up to my full potential in terms of always staying this way, obviously getting, you know, a little more relaxed, hopefully when I'm in thirties and being able to concentrate a little more on even on my personal side. But that being said, at the same time, always having that competitive, ambitious, uh, you know, motivating attitude. You mentioned how a little bit later on down the road, you, know, you, you, you might want to relax a little bit and spend a little <laughs> bit more time on the, the personal side of your life. Yep. That started to make me think about um, work-life balance, right? And, and it seems like to me, and I totally could be wrong, I'm, a lot of the times I really am, but um, <laughs> it, seem, it, it seems to me like there are two major buckets of entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. the lifestyle entrepreneur Mm -hmm. and the Mm -hmm. startup entrepreneur totally and and i think immediately you know what i mean when i say both of those yep which one are you and Mm -hmm. why are you that way yeah i mean look i'm at work on a saturday so i'm definitely not a lifestyle entrepreneur um i i'd like to think that i'm a startup entrepreneur i'd like to think that i'm somebody that walks my talk when it comes to whatever i put out i actually do try to act on it It doesn't mean to say that i don't have days where i am not as motivated it doesn't mean that i'm always like waking up at 10 a.m 9 a.m whatever it is ready to go there are times i walk in at 2 p.m just feeling groggy but at the same time i always am very tactical and raw in my approach when I think about entrepreneurship. I don't think about it in a flowery way. I think about it in a very um, ugly, violent, like raw way in the sense of you have to work pretty much for what you get. Um, That being said, though, I I think a big, big thing about work-life balance that people should know is I I don't actually believe in it. Uh, And what I mean by that is I, I very much subscribe to the thought that even Jeff Bezos has, which is if you find something that you love to do, it doesn't become work anymore. It, it really just becomes another part of your life for sure. But there's no reason to have to separate that from your personal life in terms of making them in conflict with each other. I don't think that internal conflict between your work and your life, quote unquote, needs to exist. Uh, that being said, obviously, you should take a break. I'm not the person to ask when it comes to that. 
Um, I also am not, probably not the person to, to ask when it comes to, you know, taking a lot of days off. Like even on days that I'm traveling, I'm always traveling not for vacation, really. I think I took my first vacation in a while, like to Hawaii last month. But always when I'm traveling, I'm speaking, I'm always plugged in, even if I'm on vacation. So when I said I want to take a little step back in my 30s, what I meant by that is is starting to realize that there might be more to life than just simply building companies, uh, working on whatever project. Maybe there isn't a project anymore to work on. And that feeling, even for a couple of days, would be lovely to have in terms of just enjoying what's around me. Um, I'm not a very nature-oriented person. I hope that in my 30s, even now, like maybe I can become that a little more. It's very hard, though, to do it in Toronto, where it's like concrete and cement everywhere. But yeah. <laughs> you mentioned something that was very interesting, and I really want to drill down more into that. I believe you said that um, you, your view of entrepreneurship is very tactical, that it's yeah. ugly, it's dirty, it's messy, and you really have yep. to work to get to where you want to go. Can you yep. talk about that? Like, what exactly mm-hmm. do you mean by that? Sure. I mean, look, entrepreneurship is very glamorized in the media. Um, it is portrayed as, you know, you're on private jets, you're having bottle service every night, you're enjoying with your friends, you're taking meetings with like high profile people all the time. When in actuality, it's normally just days like this, you know, me and my head of sales, Scott, who's literally seated across the boardroom right now. Uh, we're the only two people in the office right now. Uh, it's a Saturday. These are the days that, you know, entrepreneurship isn't really shown in this light, I feel like, on the news or in the media. So that's what I mean when I say ugly, messy. It isn't to say that I'm not enjoying it. I'm enjoying every second, by the way, of doing this podcast. I'm enjoying every second of coming in and working with Scott and the conversations that we have here. Um, and it brings a lot of clarity to my mind when I leave a day thinking I actually accomplished a lot. Like yesterday, for example, more than any day, I think in the entire month, I left feeling, wow, I got a lot done. You know, I took some external meetings. I really, you know, brought down my, uh, you know, email from 167 unread to zero, followed up with a lot of people. And, and I had a lot more clarity leaving work. And those are the days that I want to have more off. So, again, it doesn't mean that I'm taking a high profile meeting all the time. But even getting my email from 167 unread to zero is a small victory in my mind. And it's something that really shows how tactical and raw I really get. I get down to these minute details when it comes to where I extract my happiness from. But when you get to that zero emails left, it's like, yes. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm back I'm back up to like 38 now. So yeah, after this call, I'll be focusing on getting it back down to zero. <laughs> <laughs> so we've talked a lot about business and mm-hmm. entrepreneurship and building businesses. And one part of business is to make money. Right, it's, yep. it's it's a huge impetus, right, to to building a company. However, money and wealth, to me, are not the same thing. No, but I'm interested in what your definition of wealth is. Sure. Um, so first of all, when it comes to money, I obviously have uh, an importance for it. I do believe it's important. But I, you can pretty much ask anyone, but I know I, they'll tell you that I have no aspiration to become a billionaire. I have no aspiration to have a lot of money. That is not an aspiration of mine. Um, the, the reason I started this company was to do great work with great people, um, to, to work with partners that I believe are awesome when it comes to not only what they do, but what they can teach me as a person. And that's what I would define wealth as. Um, the difference between money and wealth is wealth is about not just material things. It's a lot about your mindset. It's the, the ideas, the information, the processes, all of everything that goes through your mind. Um, I believe that wealthy people can come from poor backgrounds. I believe wealthy people can be in poor backgrounds um, as long as they have a certain mindset and a certain way of viewing the world that is more sophisticated and is richer than anyone else. When you talked about how your family is very important to you and how a lot of the things, maybe not a lot, but some of the things that you learned were from your family and, and some uh-huh. of the things were from your school and from the people on the debate team and, and uh, from, from college and just being surrounded by different people in your networks. In your opinion, what was more influential on you? 
your your I guess the the root of the question is what do you think is more important your nature or your nurture totally I think it's a mix between the both I, if I had to pick between one though I definitely think your nurture um, I think you could you know again like there's so many people that are naturally gifted if that's even a thing right they're naturally talented in something but they grow up and they become for for you know lack of a better word uh, shitheads <laughs> you know and and quite honestly they become people that you cannot tolerate to be around because their whole life they've been touted as great people and nobody has had the audacity to go up to them and question them. Um, so I definitely think nurture plays a role in that. Your environment, the people around you, the the situation that you're in, it will teach you lessons. And all of the, everything that, you know, you see in front right now, the person that I am right now, I attribute 90% of it to the experiences that I've had. So the people that I've met, uh, the relationships that I've had, um, the, the, you know, startups that I've built that have both become successful or have failed, um, and just some of the thoughts that I've also had throughout my entire life so far. I want to thank you so much for coming on the interview today. Um, no worries. You know, I, I can only imagine how, uh, how precious your time is and, and how busy you must be. Um, you're probably up to like 50 emails now. So. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you having me on, honestly. This is this has actually been one of the best interviews I've had because um, I really liked how you distilled each part of my life down really drilled deep. Not a lot of people do that. So um, when you started off, honestly, with the first question of what's your story, I was like, all right, cool, here we go again. But I really didn't expect like the interview to be that deep. So I, I really, really had fun. Well, I, I appreciate you going deep with me because I, you know, I can ask questions all day, but if you sure. as guests are not not willing to go there, then you know it's it just won't happen. So thank you very much for that. Two more questions for you, then uh, then we'll sure. wrap up. First question: um, Is there an important part of who you are mm -hmm. that we did not talk about today? In other words, yeah. what did I miss? <laughs> so you didn't miss anything uh, per se. We we went through a pretty comprehensive outlook into my life, but. Um, I think the one thing that we indirectly touched on is the importance of family, but more importantly, the biggest value that I hold. Um, and the, the thing, by the way, if you want to be my friend, um, or if I was in this interview and somebody said this to me, I would immediately hire them is loyalty. Um, it is the single most important thing to me more than anything else is, is if you were somebody that has a feeling of loyalty, not only to other people, but to yourself, to your mission, to your purpose, uh, I really, really admire that. Last question, and again, thank you very much for uh, for humoring me here because this one <laughs> is a uh, whoops, actually knocked the mic. Um, this one is a bit of a selfish question, so mm -hmm. please humor me. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because I really don't often get guests who are so accomplished at such a young age. This is an interesting question. Uh, for, for me to be asking now. Um, I'm 24, mm -hmm. right? I have multiple businesses, have this show. Mm -hmm. What question should I be asking you mm -hmm. that I would not think to ask, but I should? Uh, very interesting. Um, the, the question that I love asking people the most, which kind of puts them into a little edge, is uh, what is the what is the one truth that you believe that you believe most other people would disagree with you on? So you can use that by the way, in an interview, it's a great question to ask, by the way, if you're going to put it back on me, I can kid you not. I do not have the answer for that. <laughs> I, I have thought so hard about it. I'm like, what do I believe that most people disagree with? And, and without being like overly controversial, like I don't, I don't see any, any belief that I have that really stands apart from mainstream opinions. But uh, it could be a cool question to ask, uh, especially future guests, especially. That's an awesome question. That's a great question. So, Swish, I want to thank you so much for uh, for coming on the show and uh, for, for sharing all that you have. And to everybody who's listening, I want to thank you all so much for supporting the show and for, for listening, for watching, and for being a part of this this mission that we're on, right? I mean, we are here to help people build a business create their dream life so that we can all live in a better world together. 
So I want to thank y'all so, so, so much for being a part of that. And I love you guys. So, Swish, do you want to wrap us up, man? Thank you again so much. No worries. Thank you very much, everyone. And if, if there are anything that, that I can take away with this, uh, if any of your listeners have any questions, just feel free to hit me up on Twitter at GoSwish, G-O-S-W-I-S-H. Hit me up with a question. Tell me you listen to this, and I'm more than happy to help out with anything. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, you have a fantastic day, and I'll see you on the next episode.